So here we are at the apartments um, outside Oak Avenue, just off Manningham Lane in Bradford's infamous red light district. And behind me are the old 1960s purpose-built apartment blocks, which have since been derelict and vandalized since 2010. Now it's doubtful many people in this area would know the story of what happened here because it's here that the Yorkshire Ripper committed his uh, one and only murder that happened indoors. So it's quite a unique spot on the trail of the Yorkshire Ripper. Well, this place has certainly seen better days. It's been um, derelict since uh, 2010. The Wreckers Ball is destined to fall on it, and only last year the building's been sold. When I first came to explore this area a couple of years ago, I found this whole place trashed with litter, with uh, bottles, um, waste clothing, uh, needles and syringes. And it tells you that basically, over the time, this whole building has become a kind of shelter, a privacy area for people who are alcoholics and drug takers. In recent years, teenagers having mad parties who come in and they spend the time drinking away, smashing all the windows, setting fire to some downstairs areas and graffiti like this over here. So it's right here that we have Patricia Atkinson living here from around about the 12th of April, 1977, just 10 days before she died. Her life was happier. She had uh, met a man called Rima Mitra um, many years before, back in 1960, when she was just 16 years old. They fell in love, they got married and had three children. But like many relationships of the 1970s here in Bradford and Leeds, Alcohol and bad living took its toll, and soon the marriage broke apart. She probably felt she was too young, and she wanted to go and live life more. But as alcohol took its grip, the marriage struggled, and eventually he moved out, and she, he had custody of the kids just after that. She went in the downward spiral, and to fund her alcohol, um, she turned to the oldest profession in the world, prostitution. So whereabouts in these buildings did uh, Patricia Atkinson live? Well, she lived downstairs in flat number three. And to get there, the only way to do that was to come through the front main door and to make your way down. This is the downstairs part of the building and Patricia Atkinson rented a flat, flat number three, just at the end of this dark corridor.
So, this is the main uh, room in the bed sit. This would be the bedroom, stroke, the living room combined. And the first thing you would see when you came into this room would be the bed over here. A uh, small bed, a small double bed, and a headboard in this corner, and a flooring duvet cover here. Over towards here, you have a table sitting right there, got a few bits and pieces, handbag, what have you. Over here towards the window, you would have a dressing table uh, with a mirror on the side. You had two chairs, one on either side. This was all one window, and uh, since 2010, it's been boarded up. And luckily for light, somebody has removed the boarding since then. What's really interesting though, is this fire escape door. But it's not really a fire escape, it's more like a door to lead to a small balcony area, part of this building. Now, we're on the ground floor, and what's interesting is that in Patricia Atkinson's time, she had moved her wardrobe across and positioned it in front of the door. And this probably gave her a sense of security and away from the outside world. If you look at the crime scene photographs, you could just make out the top of the door frame behind that wardrobe. Past the wardrobe, you had a two-seater couch, you had a map on the wall, and over here, still on the wall today, is this socket. And attached to this socket was one of those old electric bar heaters that sat on the side and would give um, heat. These flats were very, very cold. Now, Patricia Atkinson moved in here about 10 days before her murder, and um, she used this place for the purposes of bringing clients back. This would have put her ahead of the rest of the competition, who normally had to service clients out in back alleys, uh, in street corners, or on waste ground. On the 23rd of April, 1977, Patricia Atkinson brought back Peter Sutcliffe through that door right there. As they came in through the door, Patricia Atkinson made her way over towards the window and she then closed the curtains. In the meantime, Sutcliffe had removed his jacket and hung it on the back of the living room door. But in doing so, inside his pocket, he had a claw hammer. As Atkinson came across, she sat down on the bed, roughly about here. She had started to remove her jeans. Sutcliffe, seeing his opportunity, gave her a devastating blow to the back of the head and the poor woman collapsed right here on the floor. Sutcliffe then picked her up and positioned her body now onto the top of the actual bed. In doing so, he left behind a shoe print. It's the same shoe print that was found at the murder scene of Emily Jackson, which would then tie these murders together. As she lay in the bed, Sutcliffe delivered several more blows on top of her head, fracturing her skull in several places. Later, the pathologist would say that the head had a marble bag effect. He could feel the multiple fractions in the skull. He then proceeded to undress her. He pushed her bra up above her breasts. He pulled her pants down to her knees. He then committed a savage, brutal attack upon her body with the hammer. As he did so, he turned the hammer round to the claw end and started clawing on her body without mercy. He attacked her genitals, her abdomen, and her chest. When he was finished, he pulled over the flowery sheet over her body and he made his way out the door. And as he did so, he heard the woman gargling away. This was probably the death rattle. He knew she was in no state to tell anyone. He left and exited the building, leaving behind a gruesome, terrifying murder scene. So that was the murder of Patricia Atkinson here in his apartment on the 23rd of April 1977 and her body would be discovered the next day by her friend Robert Henderson when he came to call on her. He opened the door, walked in and found her 
horrifically mutilated body on the bed. He rushed to the caretaker's house, Mr. Jack Robinson. He looked after all these apartments and called him to the scene and they then alerted the police. Interesting enough, when the press came to look at the scene, Mr. Robinson, the caretaker, was standing exactly where I'm standing now. There's a superb photograph of him in the Telegraph in Argus. And behind him, the windows and the curtains are drawn as the police conduct the investigation into this murder. But this murder is interesting because up until now, all the murders committed by the Yorkshire River were committed in Leeds. And soon, because of the footprint and the way the mutilations were done on the body, along with the hammer blows, they soon linked this murder to that of Will McCann, Emily Jackson and Irene Richardson. And very soon, the killer that was known up until now as the Leeds Jack the Ripper became known as the Yorkshire Ripper. <laughs>